While you are opening up to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, look over at your neighbor and ask them, do you have your girdle on? <laughs> do you have your girdle on? Now you got to work with me just a little bit right here. You have to know that there's a point in this somewhere, so just stay with me a little while. My mind don't always work like everyone else's. Thank God yours don't sometimes on that one right there. I have had in my past, I have a history of making really dumb decisions sometimes. Anybody else? Okay, the rest of you are lying or asleep or bless your hearts. All right. I, I've been chronic with this thing. And so here, let, let's lay this foundation of where we're going to go to with, with this verse right here. We're, we're going to... We're going to talk about girding up the loins of your mind. I just love the way that's put right there. You know, it's like, I need a girdle for my brain. <laughs> and I'll just be honest with you, I don't, really, I don't really have a lot of experience with girdles. I, that may surprise some of you. I, I don't. And so I deferred to my lovely wife this morning, and I asked her, could you give me information as to the purpose and the function of a girdle? And we're going to, we're going to liken that as to a girdle for the brain. And so she said, first of all, it's to keep things in that don't need to be exposed. <laughs> Everybody say amen. amen. You ever let things come out of your brain that didn't need to come out of your brain? And then the other thing she said, again, working off of Miss Marsh's definitions of the girdle, it's to make things look better than they really are. <laughs> Anybody say amen? amen? Now, we're equating this to the girdle on the brain. I don't know, but I suspect that there are a lot of stories. As I get older, here's one of my favorites. Now, now I'm at that place in that stage of life, the silver fox stage, my words, where I get to blame it on senior moments. But the truth is, probably pretty quickly after I got out of diapers, I started having senior moments. Anybody say amen? amen. Work with me a little bit. It'll go easier on you if you'll help me. So here's one of my favorites. Anybody see my glasses? You know, I mean, it's, it, just kind of lost it for a minute. Just, you know, little brain, little guy's out on his own, and he's too small to be by himself. I need to, I need to keep my thoughts contained here. I, I need to not sometimes. Have you ever been around somebody? I know nobody here is like that. You're not that person. But have you ever been around somebody that, that don't have the filter between the brain and the mouth, and they just say now, I know that, no, let's pray for them, bless their hearts, right? Wow. So, so if, 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 if we look back into your history, could we, could we find any of those moments when you have had chronic dumb? I bet we could. I, 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 it's amazed how many people want to throw themselves under the bus. A after first service, I had several come up. Let me tell you my story, DL. And it's like, and I thought I was dumb. I feel so much better about myself now. <laughs> so feel free to come and share your dumb moments when you forgot your girdle for your brain. Your brain girdle. The BG, the brain girdle. Uh, when, when you forgot that, you feel free to come up and, and share that with me after service. I'll feel a lot better uh, uh, about myself. Uh, some of those things that, that I had, I, I jotted down a few of mine. Uh, when I was a, a kid, uh, my cousins would come from out of state and from the big city, and so I like to int uh, introduce them to hillbilly games. So those of you that have been here for a while have heard me talk about hillbilly tennis. Hillbilly tennis consists of these great big red wasp nests that are built in the barns and sheds and stuff, and you pick up a handful of gravel, and you throw them, you get the wasps to swarm in, and then you start batting them. That's hillbilly tennis. Here's the fun part of that right there. You give them a really big paddle, and they don't know that they can't swing it fast enough to hit the wasp, and the wasp are going to eat them up. <laughs> and you just get a little bitty one. And anyway, fun game. Skinning cats. 
How many of y'all ever played that game as a, as a kid? So this is some of the old country. Uh, country kids back in my day played some rougher games than what some of the kids. We didn't do this thing like this right here. When we, we didn't literally skin a cat, all right? The cat was the person who didn't know. You would only be the cat one time then once you figured out what the game was. A bunch of kids would climb up a sapling, bend it over, and everybody but the cat knew the sign. And so the saplings all bending over and we're all hanging on there like a bunch of little old possums. Possums if you're from Howe County. And we're all hanging on there and everybody give everybody the look right there. And everybody would turn loose but the cat. And the cat would catapult. Sometimes they held on. They still got skinned up. Sometimes they didn't hold on. It was a, well, anyway, you know what it was. Kids don't try this at home. Some of those things uh, that we do. Um, loggers had a game. My Uncle Bentley, I grew up in a family of, of loggers working in the timber industry, and loggers play really rough games. And so I was introduced to the game of lapjack. Some of you have heard me talk about that. Lapjack is where you take a switch. I don't know why you do this. I always got switchings for being in trouble, but this is a game. It's supposed to be fun. And you hold on. It's supposed to be tough. You know, it's one of the murder, ha, you know, man the game. Get a hold of arm and loggers, and they'd take this switch, and they'd begin to start wearing one another's legs out, swapping licks, until one of them couldn't take it any longer, and you let go. And whoever let go was a big pansy, and you know, like, a, listen, I'll just be the pansy, okay? I can take it. I mean, just I'll just be the, I'll, I'm good with that. I, my Uncle Bentley wore me out. Not that I didn't need a good, anyway. So those are some of the things. Dumb. I have a pattern of dumb throughout my life. Brain, no girdle. Just a, 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 bad, a, a bad thing. And, uh, I remember in middle school taking a swing at Terry Chaney. Tiny, you remember how big he was? Terry Chaney was like, he, he was Goliath's twin. That's what he looked like to me in middle school. He was a big guy. And how, how you miss a guy like that, I don't know about you, but sometimes my blood runs a little hot, and when my blood runs hot, I don't make the best decisions. Don't look at me like that. I'm talking to you. I took a swing at this giant of a guy, same age, same class, and missed. However, I did hit the concrete wall, broke that hand. Smart, yeah. What were you thinking? Just some of the dumb stuff. I'm just going back there. I didn't even work at this list. It's just, I'm writing now fast, writing now. During praise and worship, I've got the other stuff. Flashbacks, man, come on, I'm writing more flash. I can't go into all of it. Anybody say amen? You got the, got the point. S some of my favorites, uh, I've told you the story about going to the wrong huddle, uh, playing football, <laughs> got my bell rung, went to the wrong huddle. Uh, Marsh and I, Married about three years, we bought a trailer house and we moved it out on the farm. And she's a little bit cold-natured anyway. Uh, like for instance, the other day we were sitting at the house and uh, when I get done in the evenings, you don't wanna know this, but I'm gonna share it anyway. <laughs> when I'm done for the day and I'm, I'm packing in and we're, we're, we're gonna just veg out and do the remote control and the, and the recliner thing, we're sitting there and, and I, was in my, I was in my gym shorts. I haven't seen a gym in 40 years, not since I've missed Terry Chaney. And so, anyway, and a t-shirt. And Marsh, I'm, I'm sweating. I mean, it's hot in our house. And she's sitting in her recliner with like uh, Sister Trowbridge, fluffy, you know, fuzzy earmuffs on. <laughs> kind of a thing. Some of you that know Sister Trowbridge and flashing back on that one right there. Beautiful woman of God going on to be with Jesus. If, if you're watching Miss Trowbridge, still love you. Anyway, <laughs> she's sitting in her recliner. Maybe it wasn't fuzzy earmuffs, but she, she did have a quilt over her. I had got up as I, I went in and looked at the thermostat in our house, and it was set on 81, and it was 81. Right there. And she says, it's only in that one little spot, right where the thermostat is. It's 81 right there. It's not the rest of Woo, preach. This is just true. This is just true. I mean, I'm not the only one that has chronic moments in our home. And, and, and so she's sitting over there, 
and, and she's got a quilt on her. I'm sweating it out, man. I am absolutely burning up. She has got the electric fireplace with the blower on. She's got the propane on, and we have the wood furnace pumping it in at 81 degrees, but it's just in that one little spot, and she looks over at me and says, are you cold? I'm cold. <laughs> I've never been cold, <laughs> ever, but I sure, well, anyway, you guys get in a picture, right? I mean, have you ever just, I bought a lawnmower from hell. How many of y'all, huh? Tiny bought a nice white lawnmower. It worked forever. I violated the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, don't buy that one, buy that one. But I wanted that one because it had more bells and whistles than tinies. <laughs> Hey, Tally, that's a nice mower. Look at this one right here. Three blades on this baby. All of them quit. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, pride goeth before, right? Should have listened to the Holy Spirit. Every spring, I have two flashbacks. The lawnmower from hell and how many of y'all know that gasoline in a wood circulating stove in our old trailer house. This is where I was going with the earlier story about the heat. There's been a problem for years in our home with heat. <laughs> <laughs> so in the spring, when it's like 90 outside, you let the fire go out, but by evening, you know, we're coming in, you need to rekindle the fire and get it going. So I had put, the fire was out. So I thought. Everybody say, he thought. No girdle. Brain checked out. So I put paper and I put some kindling in there and just a little cup of gas. Just a little cup. No boom boom yet. You know it's coming went to strike a match. And I've done this a bunch of times. How many of the rest of you ungirdled people, hillbillies, have tried the gas in the match thing? That's, huh? I heard one honest person, two, three. Most of the time it'll work. My matches wouldn't strike. So what do you do? You're a hillbilly, you roll up a piece of paper, you go to the stove, you fire it up. And by the time, see I shut the door because I didn't want the house to smell like gas fumes. Good reasoning. Guess where all those fumes built up? Everybody say, boom, boom, yeah. That's, so I walked around for the next three months with the one beautiful eyebrow. <laughs> Burned her slick off, baby. This is a miracle right here. God does amazing things. I blew my left eyebrow. It's somewhere between Jupiter, I don't know, it's in the third heaven somewhere. Wasn't smart enough to be a unabomber. I was just a unibrow, man, just walking around, just, just. Golly, blew myself up. Anybody else? Duh. One of my favorites. Now, now, all those, you guys are weird, man. You're sick. You're laughing at my pain. <laughs> Don't hold it against them. Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. I think maybe they do know what they're doing. But So uh, one of my favorites. Uh, see, not all of our dumb decisions have life and death situations involved. But now, one of them did. Um, I became a professional speed bump at one point in my early life, uh, growing up in the, in the log woods and was making some extra money. Uh, and uh, this true story, back the tractor up to hook up to a big old log to drag it out so we could load it on the truck and haul it to the sawmill, was in a hurry. Anybody ever been in a hurry? See, there's a lot of things that come along in life that will create these reasons that we justify taking the girdle off. The end result is still the same. Dumb hurts. And so I jumped off the tractor, didn't set the park brake. Tractor began to roll. Who rocket, fast lightning mind of mine. I go to jump on it. Problem was I tripped and fell under it. Tractor run the whole left side of my body, crushed all of this whole left side over here. Sometimes it still hurts. Big thing that God done right there at that point. I, uh, I started thinking through things a little bit more. Anybody say amen? amen? Now listen, here's where we've been. We've been talking about faith and works. Everybody say faith and works. You're going to do and you're going to be involved with. We say, we've said this for several weeks now. You're going to do and you're going to be involved in 
what you really care about. When I talk about works, I'm not talking about trying to work ourselves into heaven. How many of y'all know that that is the gift of God? That's the gift. But here's the, the, the basis of faith and works working together. If I truly believe, I believe, we just, we just made that declaration in that song with all those things. I believe that Jesus died. I believe he rose from the dead. I believe he's coming back. How many of y'all believe that our works should correspond with what we truly believe? It should just be who we are. It should just be automatic. And we need, so we've been asking this question. Last week we talked about thinking like Jesus thinks so we can do what Jesus done so we can have what Jesus had. How do we, and here, here's the line that we've been sharing, how do we become the change that we say we need to see in this world? How do we become I've been preaching that. I've, I've shared that, that line. We need to be your light and your salt. You need to be the change you want to see in this world. We've talked about our nation on a, at a pivotal place. How many of y'all believe that, right? The nation's at a pivotal place. And I believe what's going to tip the balance of the pivot is those who care the most. That's right. Those who are the most involved and engaged in this. Jesus Christ was so engaged in our life, he made the difference because he loved, because he cared, he got involved. Last week, we talked about this passage. We talked about, here's what Jesus said to do. He said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers, right? We prayed about it while we was at church. And you remember this? How many of y'all remember? And I know we had, thank God it's not another icy Sunday, right? We all got to come. Good. Those that were here, I asked you, I said, let's, let's make a habit of praying what Jesus said for us to pray. Now, this is not a line or a point of condemnation. This is just a reminder because faith and works don't just hear, but do. Power is released. Listen to me. Power is not released when you hear it. It's not even released when you believe it. It's released when you begin to walk in it and do it. The power in believing is inside you, but until you reach out by faith, that doing, putting legs to your faith, feet to your faith, that's when it's the unseen hand of the unseen man laying hold of that which is not till that which is not becomes that which is. Faith and works. I believe that this group of people cares, those that are watching. I believe that you care. I believe that you are believers. It is important. We say this continually. Belief matters, but what matters as much as what you believe is what you do with what you believe. So let's read this passage now together. And uh, you look at it up here on the, on the screen. You can, you can read it from there. This is from the King James. 1 Peter Chapter 1, verse 13. Everybody read it with me. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. Everybody say, hope to the end. Be sober. Take care of your business. Put a girdle on your brain and stay focused. Stay hooked up. Don't let everything out that comes. You can't always control what comes to your brain, but you can control what you come out, right? What, what you let out of there. He goes on and says, hope to the end for the grace of that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Wow. So, we come back to this question. Here's the question of the day. How do I become? I don't want to just preach to you, you oughtas. I want to give you some practical advice some practical direction on how we become the change that we want to see. So, I believe that good lives are made or created through good choices. Hmm? Last week. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And verse 19 was where we ended last week. So, working hard here this morning, I'm to the end of last week's sermon now. Now we'll get started on today's. Deuteronomy 30, 19, and he says, choose, right? Choose. 
I, I'm setting before you choices. Blessing. Everybody say blessing or curse. Which one do you want? Simple, right? Good and evil, life and death. Choose. And so how do we, how do we become the change, the transformation that we think our world needs to see? Well, first of all, it begins by making good choices. Making good choices. What do those good choices look like? Here's, here's a preset. How many of y'all have preset buttons maybe on a stereo or on a television or something like that? And, and it's already preset. It's going to take you there immediately. It's, it's, it's preset. So I have some preset buttons that in my life, these decisions that come along and, 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 and we make choices constantly. You've made a bunch of choices already today. You'll make a bunch more before the day is over with, and it'll start all over again this way. Tons of choices. There are some that are preset. Number one, if I have to make a choice between God and not God, how many of y'all know I'm going to choose God? That's easy to say on Sunday morning in a very controlled environment. But sometimes the right choices, sometimes the God choice is hard to make when you're in the furnace. See, we could spend a bunch of time talking this morning about three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many of y'all know they faced a pretty hot choice, huh? Here's, here's a word from a cruel leader, from a cruel king. He said, now listen, when you hear the sound of the music, when you hear the, the, the sound of the, the drum, the psaltery, the heart, when you hear these things, you better bow, because if you don't bow, you're going to burn, right? Daniel chapter 3. You can read it for yourself, familiar story. Daniel chapter 3. And I love the response of the three Hebrew children. The way that they come back to this, they have already made a predetermined choice. I choose God. I choose God. And sometimes that's not an easy choice. And let me share this with you. I believe that the world that we're living in is going to continue to put more and more pressure on the good God choice. Settle some things in your heart. It's a lot easier to make a decision when it's already settled in your heart. Here's the one. I have four that I have just pre-written down. I choose God. I choose faith. I choose my family. And I choose my friends. Those are really important to me. That's me. You'll have to make your own choices. I'm going to choose God. I'm going to choose blessing, not cursing. I'm going to choose life, not death. I'm going to choose good, not evil, to the best of my ability. But to do that, I've got to keep the girdle on the brain. Huh? I've got to keep it focused. You've got to keep it right, right here. Remember we talked last week, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind. What did he think like? He thought like a servant. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. That's why I said, let's, let's pray for laborers to go. There's a lot of harvest that needs to be done. Did anybody pray this week? Did anybody harvest? Again, not a point of condemnation. Let's do that. Listen, you need to let, you sh let, let your light shine and shake your salt, sister. Huh? That's who we are. The world's not going to do it. It can't do it. If you don't do it and I don't do it, it won't get done. And it needs to be done. That's what will tip the scale. Do we care? If we care, why don't we do it? We're distracted. We neglect. We've talked about that a bunch. So it comes a time when we need to do this. We need to do this. Decisions. Choices. Preset. Some of them just ready to go. I heard, or actually I read a long time ago, a, a line that talks about goal setting. How many of y'all believe you ought to have some goals in life? And, and I agree with that. The, the line said something along this right here. It said, uh, as you're working on your goals, your goals are working on you. Your, your, your goals make you into someone that you would have never been. And, and, and I teach this in leadership class on Sunday nights. Uh, goals, in the, in the context of just simply being a goal, never will achieve anything. Goals don't achieve anything until they become priorities. And then you have to pursue your priorities. Everybody say, pursue your priorities. 
pursue your priorities. What, what, what does that mean? It's not truly a priority. Here are three things that I think that a priority looks like. Number one, number one, a priority needs to be clear enough to create vision. A priority needs to be clear enough to create vision. I prioritize God, therefore, that vision. Listen, I'm not just playing for today. I'm playing for tomorrow. I'm playing for the future. I believe God has the best plan for DL. I believe that. I've bought into that with my whole heart. So I'm going to pursue that. That has become clear vision to me. It didn't used to be. I pursued a lot of other stuff. More stories on the page. Dear God, some of the dumbest things I've ever done. The years of the drugs and the alcohol. Wow. Talk about some dumb stuff. Anybody say amen? Hmm? Sure. Sin will make you into someone God never intended you to be. And someone you don't want to be. Someone you don't even like. You look in the mirror and you're disgusted with yourself. Aren't you glad God loved you? Listen, God don't just, oh man, listen to this one. Lean in right here. God don't just see us as we are. He sees us as we will be. That's just, yeah. God don't. And the world sees us as we are. And I sometimes I get caught in, see people, right? And then we talk about it, huh? Aren't you glad God sees you as you will be? And he's saying, he's saying, don't give up on them now. If you can see them a year from now, they won't even look like the same person. Because they won't be. I'm not who I was. Hmm? Or who I'm going to be. Amen? Choices. What are your choices? So, priorities. That they are clear enough to create a vision. They need to be strong enough to help us persevere through the hard times. Clear enough to create strong vision. They need to be strong enough to help us persevere. How many all know just because you got a priority don't mean you're not going to have obstacles. You're going to have giants. You're going to have stuff come in the way of getting to that. And then the third one is that they need to be valuable enough that we're willing to pay the price valuable enough are you pursuing your real priorities listen to me good people people who care people who love God people who believe are you pursuing your real priorities are they so valuable that you're willing to pay the price no matter what I can't say that about everything but when it comes to my God when it comes to my faith. The three Hebrew children, when it comes to their God and when it comes to their faith, when you hear the sound of the music, you bow. And their response was, what? again, you can read this in Daniel 3, their response was, listen, king, we ain't bowed. So they didn't. Music went off. Everybody else, how many of y'all know? Awkward, you're the only one standing. Everybody else is bound. That's kind of the obvious. Let me share with you, Christian, you're supposed to stand out. Huh? You're not like the rest of the world. You're not better than. Don't forget your station in life. The only difference between me and the worst sinner on the face of the earth is I've just been, I've just been forgiven. Huh? Just been forgiven. I'm not trying to work my way into heaven. That's a gift of God. I'm trying to live my faith. My faith says this, so my actions should be in alignment with my faith. If it's not, it's hypocrisy. And so, in that context, their response to the king, your faith and works under fire. Faith and works under fire. Their response to the king was, we're not bowing. And that's easy enough to kind of get up in the king's grill to start with on, on that and just be defiant and stand when everybody else is bowing. I mean, I know there's some things we need to stand for in our day and in our time. And, but then they, the king comes to him and he's mad. You, you read the story and, and, and it says he, he's got some fury going on. And he says, did you guys not hear? Did you guys not? I'm going to kind of give you a back door to think this thing over. Oh, no, we heard. We, we, we were very clear on the instruction. We got it. 
You just need to know that the God that we serve, He's able to deliver us from you, but even if He don't, we still wouldn't bow. I love that. DL's free running translation of that would be Pee Wee. We ain't bowing to you. You're not worthy of a bow. Here's what Scripture says to the believer. It says to the believer that we'll all stand before God and that we will bow before Him. I've got one bow, and I'm saving it for the one that's worthy. It's His, and I'm not giving it to anything or anyone else in this world. Huh? Now, it's easy to say at church on Sunday morning. Woohoo! We can get in here and we can talk it up. We can cheerlead, right? Break out my cheerleading suit and my pom-poms. Nobody wants to see that, right? That's another example of the brain just getting ungirdled right there. <laughs> Nobody wanted to see it. All right. Deuteronomy 30, chapter 11. This is the commandment which I command you this day. And we're going to run a correlation between Deuteronomy 30 and Romans chapter 10. I mean, all are familiar with the passage of Romans chapter 10 says, The word is nigh thee, it's even in your mouth. A word of faith, which we preach, that if you believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be what? Saved. <coughs> Romans 10 is, is copied. It's brought from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So when we read this, you need to know that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote Romans, goes back and he looks at this, he's aware of this, and he brings it in to the revelation of Jesus Christ, the new covenant, and what it means to us today. Here's the word in the old covenant for this commandment. Everybody say commandment. Which I command thee this day is not hidden from you. It's not far from you. Everybody say, I can reach it. This is not out of reach. It's not hidden. It's not somewhere where I can't get a hold of it. He says, it's not hidden, neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it to us, that we may hear it and what? Everybody say, faith and works. Faith isn't released. The power of faith isn't released when you hear it or just when you believe it, but it's when you put action to your faith, faith and works, because faith by itself, faith without works is what? It's dead. You have to put feet to your faith. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee. Romans 10. The word is very nigh unto thee. It's in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. It's right here. It's the word of God that's in us that we embrace it, that we engage it, and we live true to our faith that our actions and our works are not in conflict. Verse 15. See, I have, everybody say see. Can we see this? The power of choice. I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God. And if you love God, you care about God. And if you love your neighbor, you care about your neighbor. And I'm going to do and be involved in what I truly care about. Amen? In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless you in the land whether thou goest to possess it. But if your heart turn away, so that thou shalt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days upon the land whithersoever thou goest the Jordan to possess it. Now I want to just pause right here. We'll put a parenthetical statement in right here. Jesus took this and made it so much easier for us to walk in. 
under the old law, and we won't have time to read it this morning, under the old law, when you go and read Romans 10, starting at about verse 4 or 5, and read down through verse 10. Do that this week. Do that this week, Romans 10, reading through from about 4 to 10, and he's, he's talking about this. The simplification of this is, here's what, I, here's what I need to do in this plan right here. I need to just stay hooked up with Jesus. I need to stay focused on that because in him, everything else is contained. Everything else is contained. I don't have to do all of these steps of the law. I just stay hooked up in Jesus. In him, we live and we move and we have our being. Thank God for grace. Now then, he says, verse 19, and this is the one that we read last week. I call heaven and earth to record this day, to record this day. There's a record. Let's just talk about that for a moment. Don't hear a lot of preaching about this, but it's still true. How many of y'all believe there's a record being kept? Hmm? I'm about, I'm about done for the day. I've got seven things that are listed. We're going to pray these over you today. I'm going to teach on them. Not next week. Vic Porter will be here next week, but the week following then I'm going to teach on these seven things. These are things that, practical things that we can do every day. I mean, I don't know, sometimes it's not the big decisions of life and death. It, it's, it's not the... Sometimes you have choices that will take you down the road to the fiery furnace. Three chapters later in Daniel chapter 6, the lion's den story, right? Sometimes we have those huge, huge, big decisions. But I found that life is full of so many small decisions. For instance, Jesus said that we should pray. We talked about that last week. But how many of you actually prayed? Now listen to me. This is not a point of condemnation. This is a point of encouragement. I'm going to keep pressing you. I'm going to keep pushing you because I think that you have the power to make the difference in this world. I believe that. I believe that you're light and I believe that you're salt and I believe both of those are elements that make change in whatever environment they're introduced into. Heaven's keeping a record. God, there's a record being kept today. As a pastor, I, 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 let me be honest with you, I think the last thing you really need to do is to hear another sermon. I think we need to do the ones we've heard. Now listen, I know that this is kind of stout and this is kind of, and I'm not wanting it to be sour. Listen, gang, this is not about just hearing it and believing it. It's about doing something with it. It's about walking right out the door and getting out there in this big old world and, con and contributing, engaging into the world that Jesus has set us in and make a difference for good, for blessing. For life, not cursing evil. Amen. And that's just truth, gang. I don't know how to put it any other way. So last week, we, we, we ended with this. Um, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. It's a record. That I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose. Seems obvious, doesn't it? Seems obvious. What are the practical sides of, of life? Here's what I'm going to pray over you here just in a moment. Here's what I think that we can do, that we should be about. Practical things. Here's what I do if I truly want to be the change I want to see. Number one, I need to be prepared. I need to be ready. I think that you're going to play like you prepare. And so in preparation, there needs to be the planning, there needs to be the practice, there needs to be all of that right there, but there needs to be prayer. How many of us start our day without praying? And again, I'm, just, I'm not trying to be ugly, I'm not... 
We get up with the rush of the day and we don't even spend a moment with God. No wonder we lose our peace by the time we walk into the front door of the work, at the workplace. There's just some practical things. And if you've lost your peace, you lose your peace, you lose your joy, you lose your joy, you lose your strength, you lose your strength, and you lose the battle. It's the domino effect. And it don't always mean that your day is going to go perfect just because you prayed. Just because that you prayed, you've already connected and hooked up with God before you got there. Hmm? Last week I talked to you about having a prayer list. Did you? Please do if you didn't. Okay? And again, I'm not trying to be ugly. Man, I've made so many dumb, hmm, took the girdle off the brain. I have a pattern, a history of it. But I, I don't want to continue in that. Let's make the changes that we need to make. Make the changes we need to make. Preparation. Here's something that I need to do. Choose courage and refuse fear. You know the two main tactics of the enemy to, 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 to tear us down every day is intimidation and lies. Intimidation and lies. Number three, to make your stand according to what the Word of God tells us. You need to make a stand on the power of the Word of God because the Word of God is not changing. And when you're standing on that, guess what? You've got the high ground. Live and battle like you have the high ground. Execute the plan. Execute the plan, number four. Number five, walk it out all the way. The three Hebrew children. Pauline, I might have been... I might have been at the point whenever I got up to the edge of the fiery furnace. I know I've been talking smack to you, Mr. King. I was just kidding. That thing looks hot. And try to crawl that out of the thing and back out. You just walk it out. Because they did get thrown in the furnace. Their faith was put to the test. The trying of our faith, right? The trying of our faith. And that's 1 Peter above verse 13 where we started out. It's precious. That's a different way of looking at faith being put on trial. They come out of the furnace with promotion. Daniel come out of the lion's den. I, I wrote down um, in Daniel chapter 6 verse 23, uh, this is what the king said about Daniel after he come out of the lion's den. There's no hurt because he believed in his God. His God rescues, he works signs, he works wonders. And so this Daniel prospered during the reign of King Darius. The power of prayer and believe in God. Not asking you to go and save the world. Us just start by praying for it. What kind of a church do you want to be a part of? How many times have you heard somebody, well, I'll pray for you and wonder if they really did? Listen, I'm not trying to be ugly. Let's do it or don't say it. To the best of our ability. And, and when we fall short. Let's walk it all the way out. Number six. Let's look for victory or a way of escape. How many of y'all know he makes a way of escape sometimes? And that's what victory looks like. He gets you out of the situation where there don't look like any way out. And number seven is this one right here. And it's plan for the future. I know God's got a plan. It's plans to prosper us. Plans to bring us, right what Jeremiah said, to an expected end. I'm going to pray those seven things over you, and we're going to teach some more on those. These are things that we do. If you didn't have time to get them all written down, you can go and check out the church's website. It'll be loaded up on the YouTube and the archives in a little while, and you can, you can get it there and go back over and just begin to pray and to study and to meditate on these things. Let's press in. Let's be light and let it shine. See, he says you can be a light, but you could put the veil over it and hide it. Doesn't mean you're not a light, it just means you're not shining. Huh? So let's be light, let's shine it, let's be salt, shake it on this world. Father God, <coughs> you stand with me, you've been sitting for a while. We're just going to make this real simple. And if you've got prayer requests or you've got needs, we'll be happy to pray with you. Uh, personally, we'll be here until everyone is going we're here for you we'll stay and we'll pray with you if you have something that you want to pray about father god we pray these things today over the 
congregation that's here, those that are watching, those that will watch, Lord God, these things that we have preset direction. It's it, already settings that are established upon our dial, Lord God, that we choose you, we choose faith, we choose family, we choose friends, Lord God. We choose your plan. Your plan is the best plan for our lives. We choose blessing, not cursing. We choose life, not death. We choose good, not evil. That's easy enough for us to say here. Give us strength with this vision. That we value this vision. It is strong enough in us that we press on past the furnaces, the lion's dens. That it is so valuable to us, Lord God, that we're willing to pay the price, whatever that is. Help us, Lord God, to understand that we need to be prepared as we go into this world, that we need to choose courage and refuse fear. We need to make a stand according to your word that we execute the plan that you have for us, knowing that we need to make adjustments sometimes along the way, that we walk it out all the way, that we don't quit, we don't throw in the towel, we don't cave in. Lord God, give us the strength that in the midst of the storm we still look for victory or that way of passage, that way of escape that you made for us. Lord God, we pray these things over this congregation that we would look not just at today or just thinking about this life, but understand that we are children of the eternal King, that we look to the future. That one day, we sang about it, we believe. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that you conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. We believe that you're coming back again. We sang it. We believe it. Now we need to live like you're coming back. Live like you're keeping a record of our life. That you're keeping a record of our choices. It's not that you could condemn us, but that you would reward us with well done, good, and faithful. For us to hear those words, we simply have to be good and faithful servants. And that requires us to make good choices. Good choices today. Good choices tonight, tomorrow. Heads bowed. Anybody here just say, listen, I've been making some terrible choices, D.L. Would you pray for me? I'm not going to call you. If you want to come up, you can. Okay, if you want. Anybody else? Listen, if you want to come up and pray, yeah, there's another. Anybody else? Just been compromising. I've preached this definition of compromise for a long, long time. Here it is. Accepting what you don't believe because you refuse to stand up for what you do believe. Don't compromise. You're God's kids. You're stronger than that. You're bigger than that. You're better than that. The power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Lives in us. Let's live up. Let's live up. Let's live up. This thing's about living, not dying. Anybody else say, just, God help me. I need to make better choices. I've, I've been... Hmm? Just a simple, simple request. And again, Marsh and I will be here to pray with you. We're not going anywhere. We're not in a hurry. We're here. We're just going to pray with you if you need it. You come and see us after service. Father God, thank you. Thank you for my church family. Thank you for those that are watching, Lord God. Oh God, you are so good to us. You are so gracious to us. When we make bad choices, your mercy and your grace. Mm. God, you don't quit on us. I thank you that you don't see me just as I am, but you can see me as I will be, what you're making me into. Thank you, God, for not quitting on us and giving up on us. Thank you, Lord God. Stir our hearts. Let this thing be real between us and you. Not about a bunch of church hype, 
real faith. Hype's not going to help me when the storms come, when the giants show up. Hype ain't going to change nothing. This needs to be real faith. Real faith gets hold of real solutions because we have real problems. Dismiss us now in your grace and in your mercy with an understanding, Lord God, we're living for you, not just living for today, but living for a future, an eternal home. Thank you for grace, for mercy, for love, for the blood of Jesus that saved us. Dismiss us in your love. Love for you, caring for you. Love for one another, caring for one another and those outside these doors. Let us go now and shine in Jesus' name. Everybody agreed, said amen. amen. Look over to your neighbor and tell them don't forget your girdle. Love you.